This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. At a speaker's luncheon of November the 5th, historian and writer Mark Zulke spoke to the RCMI on the Battle of the Hochwald, one of the dirtiest engagements ever fought by the Canadian Army in World War II in February-March of 1945. The winter of 1944-45 was the worst to strike Europe in 50 years. For the Allied and German troops strung out across the Netherlands and along the border country of France and Germany, clear over to Switzerland, these were months of misery. I don't imagine Canadian Provost Corps' Lance Corporal Bill Cooksey, pictured here, enjoyed his that's January 9th, 1945 shift. Traffic, he was directing traffic near Nijmegen in Holland. As had been the case since the advance out of Normandy in early September 44, 1st Canadian Army guarded the Allied left flank. This meant the Army was stretched thinly from the Dutch coast across to Nijmegen on the border with the German Rhineland region. As most of the Canadian forces were positioned on the southern bank of what the Dutch called the Mass River and the French the Meuse, this period is remembered by our soldiers as the watch on the Mass. Along the lines Although the lines were largely static, the Canadians engaged in aggressive patrolling. Most patrols went out attired in the white kind of camouflage suits that you see here. The Germans were also patrolling, and short firefights were common. Both sides hoped to ambush the other and ideally take prisoners to be interrogated for intelligence purposes. It was a very deadly game, and one at which the Canadians proved especially adept. Consider the case of German grenadier Franz Bauer, whose patrol had dug itself into a haystack from which to observe Canadian outposts. An hour, within an hour, four Canadians jumped them and took them by surprise. Everything happened so fast, Bauer said afterward, that in spite of our careful watching and our weapons, it was almost impossible to defend ourselves. It is still a mystery to me where the enemy came from. They stood before us as they they'd literally come out of the ground. I said to my comrades that we need not be ashamed of being taken prisoner, for we could not keep up with men as skilled and disciplined as those of the Canadian patrol, in spite of the fact that we had been soldiering for over five years. The most heavily, this isn't the greatest map, but it's the only one I could find that gives you a little bit of detail on the salient. The most heavily defended ground within the Canadian sector was the Nijmegen salient, uh, I'm going to have to step over here. There we go. So the uh, salient, uh, where was the there we are, it's there, and this area in here. Um, and that was the most heavily defended ground within the Canadian sector. It had been won during the September advance toward Arnhem as part of Operation Market Garden. As the advance stalled short of Arnhem and the Rhine, the Allies decided to keep that ground that they had won despite its having to be defended on three different sides. The salient was kept because it was seen as a stepping off point for the next great Allied offensive, which would punch out of the, from Nijmegen Grosbeek, and you can see Nijmegen up there, and Grosbeek's right beside it, on the salient's eastern flank and into Germany's Rhineland. Service within the Nijmegen salient by 1944 was viewed as not only terrifically uncomfortable, but also extremely dangerous. Soldiers, as is their tendency, recognized this with a variety of ironic welcoming signs on the roads running into the salient. The uh, artillery on both sides engaged in daily duels, and 1st Canadian Army feared that the Germans would launch a major attack to try and pinch out the salient. So they kept up a constant barrage to just keep the Germans hunkered. The Germans, meanwhile, feared, correctly so, that it would serve as the platform for a future major offensive. Exactly when and where such an offensive would fall was heavily debated all along the German command chain. Meanwhile, while we were trying to keep the Germans guessing a little, the finalized plans were made in December and set to launch early in, month, in January. This photo was taken during one of the last planning sessions conducted by Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery in the center and 1st Canadian Army Commander General Harry Crear in the heavy coat who's smoking a, a, a cigarette as was his habitual habit. 
Also participating in this session was Second Canadian Corps Commander Lieutenant General Guy Simmons, who's got the beret and the tall fellow. This photo has a certain poignancy that I like, because although Simmons was subordinate to Career Arm, Montgomery trusted and respected his strategic knowledge more than he did the top Canadian commander. In fact, Montgomery public, privately and some ways, somewhat times publicly disdained Creerar, while he considered Simmons a bit of a protege. Simmons shared Montgomery's opinion of Creerar and had a somewhat psychophantic relationship with Montgomery that went so far as mimicking, to some degree, his dress and habits. Note that the two of them are both wearing tanker berets while Creerar is wearing the traditional general's red cap. And I also note that Creerar is about two feet distant from the other two. Uh, he, was never in, he was never in the club. <laughs> Before the first Canadian Army offensive could be launched, however, Hitler rolled the dice on his last big gamble of the war, an attempt to break through the Allied lines to capture Antwerp and Brussels. Antwerp was the major port through which most Allied supplies were pouring. Capturing the port would cut off this vital supply stream, while capturing Brussels would protect the German flank to the east. Once the offensive forces were closing on Antwerp, the Germans planned to launch another attack against First Canadian Army uh, from the area south of Rotterdam. Although the Germans achieved a complete initial surprise, American and British divisions quickly responded to shore up the embattled American defenders. The German assault stalled due to a combination of this resistance, but also from the tanks literally running out of gas. Technically called the Ardennes Offensive, this operation is now more popular known as the Battle of the Bulge. While the offensive failed, it had one major consequence for First Canadian Army. The offensive into the Rhineland, which was to have occurred no later than early January, is now pushed back to early February. This is bad news. In January, the ground is still frozen, making for good movement of tanks and vehicles. By February, the spring thaws start to come, and in this part of Europe, the ground typically transforms into a morass of mud like you see there. Even more so in 1945, though, due to the preceding severity of the winter and the ongoing heavy rains that promise to persist through to at least early spring. This is an engineering group with a scissors bridge working their way towards the offensive's jumping off point. The mud here is relatively shallow, actually, compared to what was encountered in the actual battlegrounds. So you can see how difficult it was. Because of the extreme mud, Canadian lab engineers labored long and hard to maintain, as in this case, construct roads to enable the divisions tasked with the offensive to reach the start lines. This is a, called the corduroy road, and it was made by laying down a layer of logs and then pouring gravel and rubble over the top. The result produced a fairly smooth gravel road, but very, very narrow. You, you, know, you just have to line up the vehicles and just trundle along and hope for the best. If one guy goes off sideways, uh, they're going to bury in the mud and block the road. So a very difficult way of getting your, your units forward for a major campaign. On February 8th, advancing on the heels of the heaviest artillery barrage that Western Allied forces fired in World War II, First Canadian Army surged out of the Nijmegen salient and into the Rhineland with the opening of Operation Veritable. This was the first major offensive into the west of, uh, in the west across the borders of Germany. The initial offensive was under direct command of Lieutenant General Brian Horrocks and his 30th British Corps. So most of the divisions are actually British in Operation Veritable, with the Canadians, as was typical for us, once again being on the left flank. Here, 3rd Infantry Division pushed into deep ground deeply flooded by the Germans. Um, and, uh, there we go, good. Um, and on their right, the British divisions were going forward as well. This is a, a shot actually of the Canadian um, Scottish Regiment firing a part of what was called a pepper pot, which was a, a, an attempt to uh, basically smother the infantry at the, the German infantry at the front lines with uh, mortar fire, anti-aircraft guns firing, and heavy machine guns firing. So this is the Canadian Scottish Regiment's uh, small mortar pl platoon um, just laying down fire at a rapid rate. Notice just how many rounds they have stacked next to each of those uh, three-inch mortars. Incredible amount of firepower. 
the uh, attack goes forward into all these different things. The Canadians are, um, we're operating out here. And you notice it says flooded area. Uh, the, the Canadian 3rd Infantry Division attacked into an area that was completely flooded. Uh, the Germans had breached the various dikes of the Rhine River and, and let the uh, water go across into the floodplain. Nicknamed the Water Rats because they had landed on Juno Beach and then fought in the flooded polders of the Breskin's Pocket during the Scheldt Estuary, 3rd Division's battalions boarded amphibious craft such as this buffalo in order to head for their objectives on the Rhine's floodplain. There was no way that they could get to any of the places they were going to by foot. They had to get there by amphibious craft. It was just the only way forward. And there is the floodplain. And uh, that line of trees there, there are some of the amphibious boats going along there. That line of trees is actually a raised road. Um, but it's completely submerged underwater, and the only way forward was to um, for them just to basically sail towards their objectives. Um, they used those ropes because if they, the trees provided at least some measure of cover. Not a heck of a lot, but some. Away from the floodplain, the ground was firmer, and the British Infantry Division, such as this pictured here, advanced quite rapidly. Initially, German resistance crumbled under the weight of the heavy bombardment, and progress was good. The flooding, however, continued to pose major problems, not just for the Canadians, but also because the major road leading from Grosbeek east into the Rhineland was inundated. South of this route, little more than unmaintained logging roads cut through the Reichswald, so all traffic was largely funneled onto this narrow route. And as you can see, the supply convoys had to advance cautiously forward because they had to have men on the front actually looking to see for, uh, if there were obstacles in particular, hoping that they would spot any mines that still lurked under, underneath there. So it was very dangerous and very painstaking and very slow, and it put the offensive behind time, of course. <coughs> to protect the Canadians from being fired on by German forces holding the other bank of the Rhine River, a massive smoke screen was generated, the largest smoke screen ever produced in, in a, a war. Um, it was maintained through the duration of the campaign. There were literally hundreds of smoke generators spewing forth a noxious mixture of smoke created from burning fuel oil. At times the smoke became so drift, so thick, and drifted into the Canadian lines that the advancing soldiers were actually unable to see where they were going and became sick by, from the fumes. But without doubt, the uh, smoke saved many lives as the Germans on the other side of the river had to fire blind and could start, and so largely it was without effect. As part of the lead up to the offensive, every city, town and village within the objective of the Rhineland was eliminated by aerial allied bombardment in the early days of February. This is Clave, the birthplace of Anne of Clave, one of Henry VIII's wives. And at the top of the photo, you can see how the flooding has reached the city's outskirts in there. So it's all flooded to this point. And then you get into the ruins of the city. And uh, on the one hand, the heavy bombing had uh, mixed results. Because on the one hand, it stopped the Germans from being able to even rush reinforcements through on the uh, roads because they were choked with rubble from collapsed buildings. But on the other hand, once we fought our way into Clave, the shattered buildings and piles of rubble provided ideal defensive positions for the defending Germans. So we ended up having very heavy casualties when we fought our way into Clave. As the thou events continued, thousands of German soldiers surrendered and were marched back to prisoner cages in the salient. And note the fellow in the um, uh, this fellow here is wearing civilian garb, including wooden clogs. And this fellow, just notice how young he is. He's probably about 14 years old. Um, they were, at that point, as you, know, you can see, a lot of guys were either too old for normal military service or too young. But they were being rounded up and put into the units. These aren't the cracked Germans that are surrendering there. Meanwhile, behind these soldiers were massing the elite German troops, particularly those of the parachute divisions. 
This accorded with the overall plan for the Rhineland campaign, which was not just to win the ground of the west bank of the Rhine, but to kill the Germans who were the elite divisions. It was the idea was to draw the major elite divisions into the into fighting them in the Rhineland and then cut them off from being able to escape and either kill them or take them prisoner. And that was a, it was something I, I hadn't expected when I was doing my research on it, but then I started seeing again and again and again in operational orders. It wasn't just such and such was seize this ground, which is what you normally see. It was seize this ground and kill these German divisions. And you see, you hear it, see it over and over again. Kill, kill becomes the uh, major thing. Uh, both Creerar, Montgomery, Simmons, all of them are putting that in their operational orders. By February 21st, 3rd Division was embroiled in a costly battle for a small topographical feature called Moyland Wood. The Regina rifles were caught inside the wood itself in a deadly firefight against paratroopers, while the Canadian Scottish Regiment took a mauling on the southern eastern edge. The battle was turned by the Royal Winnipeg Regiment, seen here mustering in the outskirts of Clave for their advance on the woods. When the battle ended, the Little Black Devils, as the regiment is nicknamed, had lost 105 of the 207 men it was capable of committing to battle. 26 of these men were killed. The Reginas had lost 134 men in the woods, and the Can Scots had suffered 168 casualties. Fully one-third of the 7th Brigade in which they were a part were killed, wounded, or lost as prisoners. Moyland Wood is today an important and somewhat bitterly remembered battle honor for all three regiments. As the Moyland Wood battle wound down, 1st Canadian Army regrouped and the second phase of the Rhineland campaign was launched, Operation Blockbuster. As Operational Blo Veritable had largely been British divisions, Blockbuster was a second Canadian Corps show with 3rd Division still continuing its involvement. 2nd Infantry Division expanded its role, and 4th Canadian Armoured Division advanced into the fray. The initial assault on February 26th is one of the largest the Canadian forces carried out in World War II, yet it was conducted along a relatively narrow front. The ground east of the Kalkarkosh Road, this is the, uh, where are we here? Yeah, here, Kalkar down to uh, Gosh Road runs here. And there, so we're advancing in this very narrow front and we're heading towards the Hochwald Force, which is a huge obstacle just in here. And the Ballberger Wald is sort of like an extension of the Hochwald, but a railroad track passes through here and there's a little gap. So that's what we're trying to win is what's called the Hochwald Gap. Um, so that was the, the uh, focus of Operation Blockbuster <coughs> is centered on that particular thing. The Hawkfall is a heavily defended fortified line. All the villages and farmsteads between the road and the forest were incredibly well fortified. And again, the attack was preceded by a heavy artillery barrage, not on the same scale as that that launched Veritable, but still impressive. This aerial view of one of the uh, farmsteads gives a good sense of the weight of shelling the area had suffered. But notice as well the complex anti-tank trench surrounding the fortified farm buildings. Oh, well, there we are. Uh, these are anti-tank trenches, completely encircling this one building, farmstead. Very hard for, the, the, almost impossible for the Canadian tanks to get forward and support the infantry on getting onto that objective. Very, very difficult. And the raised road bed is, uh, provides an excellent uh, defensive position as well. Some of the infantry battalions attempted to reach their objectives by riding the backs of Canadian tank regiments. Most of the tanks soon mired, however, in the mud, and the infantry was forced to slog on alone. Men described the mud as literally coming up above their knees in places where they were wading through it. And always there was, as you can see here, just absolutely no cover. Um, there's a, barely a tree in this landscape. It's all just open farmland until you hit, hit the Hochwald. But of course the Germans are inside the Hochwald. So uh, it becomes very tough. <coughs> Into this fray advanced the Queen's Own Rifles, and among them Major uh, March Sergeant Aubrey Cousins. 
24 years old and hailing from Iroquois Falls, nearby Iroquois Falls, Ontario, Cousins commanded number 16 platoon of D Company. Assaulting a collection of farm buildings near Moosehoff, twice the platoon was repelled. It had gone in the attack with just 30 men and was now down to four men and Sergeant Cousins. Undeterred, Cousins ordered the four men to provide covering fire while he dashed forward armed with a stun gun and grenades. Crossing 25 yards of bullet sweep ground, he reached a tank very much like this one manned by the crew of 1st Tassars. This tank is actually South Alberta Regiment, but it serves. Cousins pointed out the buildings and had the crew fire on them with their main 75mm gun and machine guns. Under that covering fire, he then charged the buildings alone and proceeded to kill, clear each of them single-handedly. During his solo rampage, he's cr- he killed at least 20 Germans and took at least the same number of prisoner. And these were crack paratroopers he was fighting against. Fight over, he set off to report to his company commander, but was struck in the head by a, a sniper's bullet, and he died instantly. This is one of the buildings that Cousins cleared. And uh, you can see there's a small plaque mounted on the wall there that's been put in to uh, mark the, the factor that he was there. They or someone else, there's a little kind of rough family that live in this little house. And they or someone else always keeps the ivy uh, cut away so that uh, when you visit there, you can always see it. And they don't seem to mind if battlefield tours come by to take a look at it. Cousins was posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross, and he's buried in Grosbeek Canadian War Cemetery. Blockbuster continued to rage as the Canadians inched forward and closed on the hawk vault. Casualties mounted at an alarming rate, almost to the point of <coughs> overwhelming the evacuation crews who had to contend with the terrible mud and primitive roads. Here, stretcher bearers unload a wounded soldier from an ambulance jeep. At times, the wounded would be on these jeeps for several hours before they reached regimental aid posts or clearing stations that were much further back along the front lines. On March 1, the Canadians were closing on the Hawkfold and launched a major assault to break into the force. It fell to the Essex Scottish to lead the assault on the left flank, and they were to advance about 500 yards of open wide ground to the woods visible in the distance in this photo. So you can see this is where they're going to advance across, and there's the hawk vault with all the Germans waiting inside. Not good country. Major Fred Tilston's Tilston's C Company was on the left, and Major Paul Kropp's D Company to the right. Fred Tilston was going into combat for the very first time, and having been wounded during training in England, He had served since then as the battalion's adjutant, which is a headquarters job. But he was constantly lobbying for combat command. On February 22nd, the Essex was so desperately short of officers that Tilson got his wish and was given C Company. With a light bombardment providing covering fire, the two companies slipped through holes, these various holes in the hedge, and moved out into the open ground. Before going into the attack, the inexperienced Tilston asked Krop where he should keep himself and his headquarters section between the two leading platoons. Where he should keep himself, I should say. And Krop said, you stay between, behind the two leading platoons with your headquarters section and then go forward. Ignoring this advice, Tilston was the very first man in his company to reach the German barbed wire and then literally break away through it. Um, by his, with his bare hands, actually. The Germans were in these trenches and with the woods covering them. And they had, uh, you don't see them here because they were gone, but they were MG 42 machine guns, about one every 10 yards uh, in, in place. Um, Tilson had by this time been hit by a piece of shrapnel that had grazed his ear, causing a badly bleeding but not serious flesh wound. And when his platoons became pinned down by German fire, he rallied them and led them on a charge into this exact position. During that, a chunk of shrapnel sliced a four inch gap out of his hip. And this is, a, and, and basically he was still mobile, but in, in extreme pain and having a lot of difficulty. 
Among the positions that his men captured was one containing the, that 88 millimeter gun. And note also the German mortar um, right there. Um, that was also in action at the same time against them, but it, it had been moved to that position. It, it was positioned slightly to the right. Ammunition running low, Tilston began personally dashing to crops less than battled company and then carrying cans of bullets back to his men. During one of these trips, a mortar round struck about six feet from him and shrapnel tore away one of his legs and left the other mangled. By then, however, the Essex hold on the edge of the wood was firm. Tilston's one day of combat was now over and he became the second Canadian to be awarded a Victoria Cross for his bravery in the Rhineland campaign. The Essex lost 31 men killed and another 77 wounded in this fight. They took more than 100 German prisoners, captured 388 millimeter guns, a medium mortar, and many automatic weapons, and scores of Germans lay dead around the position. Tilston would eventually lose both legs, and he also lost the sight of an eye that had been injured in Normandy when a GP had been in, struck a mine, and was blown up. With the northern edge of the Hochwald secured on March 4th, operations which had been badly stalled on the southern edge and inside the adjacent Tuschenwald and Balbergerwald began to gain mo mo momentum. As the battle swung to the favor of the Canadians, the Germans start withdrawing. So we start pushing through all of these different... Um, there we are. Pushing through the Hochwald, shoving through the gap. Uh, we suffered a number of small reversals, but we always regained and kept on pushing. And the Hochwald's finally breached. It's one of the... For the people who were there, they always said um, there were no good memories that came out of the hawk vault. It was, it was just a nightmare to be fighting in that, in that place. The hawk vault was riven with a maze-like network of trenches, systems that the Canadians had to secure and, sec and clear each of them of German weapons and booby traps. Here are a couple of Queen's own Cameron Highlanders inspect one of the deadly Panzerschreck rocket launchers that the paratroopers had deployed by the dozens in gate allied tanks. The Canadians had come up against the Panzer Shrek before, but never to the extent that they ran into them in the Hawk Vault. Um, it was a very deadly weapon because, as with modern art rocket propelled grenades, it was impossible to often see the enemy who was actually firing at your tanks. Hawk Vault secure, the Canadians began advancing motorized columns through the force in order to exploit into the country beyond. Hard fighting was still to come, but both sides knew the end was near. The Germans began pulling back what troops they could in an attempt to get across the Rhine River. The end of the campaign comes between March 8th and 10th when the Canadians capture Zatten on the Rhine's western bank and establish contact with American divisions who had been closing in from the east. The German forces remaining in the Rhineland were soon eliminated or taken prisoner. For the Canadians, there would only be a brief respite, which they, like these Camerons, were able to warm up by fires and get a little rest before joining the next big operation. This would be Operation Plunder, the forest crossing of the Rhine, and that operation began on March 23, and just 43 days later, the Germans surrendered. Victory came at a terrible price. From February 8th to March 10, First Canadian Army suffered 15,634 casualties. The majority of these were British, with Canadian casualty share of these numbering 5,304. But keep in mind, most Canadians were killed or wounded during Blockbuster, and that was just 13 long and bitter days, and they yielded a loss of 3,638 casualties that were Canadian. Yet First Canadian Army had won one of the most decisive victories of the war. Almost 30,000 Germans were prisoners, and an estimated 22,000 were dead or wounded in their fighting with 1st Canadian Army. The 9th U.S. Army, meanwhile, had closed on the Germans from the other flank in 17 days of fighting, and they reported another 30,000 prisoners and another 16,000 Germans killed or wounded in exchange for a casualty total of 7,300. The Rhineland campaign's primary aim had been to not just wrest the ground from the Germans, but as I said, to destroy much of the army in the West. And First Canadian Army had succeeded beyond all expectation in that task. 
So although Essex piper Archie Beaton, seen playing his pipes outside Zatton to honor fallen comrades, was he was also playing with a sense of pride for what Canadian troops had achieved. It is my hope that we shall also remember the sacrifices the Canadians made in the Rhineland campaign and the decisive victory that they won there. Thank you. This concludes today's webcast. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying thank you for listening. You can keep up with coming events at the RCMI by visiting our website at www.rcmi.org. We hope you'll tune in again, and we hope to see you in person at coming events. Thank you, and goodbye.